How can we predict the price of Bitcoin? We are not going to see anything below 60,000 ever in the history of Bitcoin. What does happen when Apple of tomorrow comes out and says, uh, we are now buying with all our reserves Bitcoin? We have these strategies called weighted this year. So we are going to give a weight to the different phases of where you are. When will we break the 1 million US dollar barrier? We should reach 1 million around. As a full disclosure, I want to start off with um, I only buy and hold Bitcoin. <laughs> so uh, those uh, models are really interesting for me to see patterns, to see uh, things. But uh, I'm just like a hodler. I'm just buying Bitcoin. Yeah, but um, you will see I'm, I'm actually going to explain that it is also useful for hodler because... Yeah. Uh, and I will explain why, you know, because I think it goes from everything, right? From somebody who wants to be a little bit more aggressive to actually somebody that is a hodler because... You know, let's say, if, and we are already recording. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's say, for example, um, I don't know, let's say we were uh, the last cycle, right? And uh, we know that the Bitcoin, we peaked 70,000, right? And three days in advance, I'm going to tell you, hey, uh, it's going to be, in three days from now, we're going to reach a peak. Wait, wait a little bit. Wait, uh, you know, you have all this money saved up for uh, buying Bitcoin, right? Because maybe you're doing it on a monthly basis or whatever you do, you do some DCA. Wait a little bit, you know? Wait a few months because it's going from 70,000 to 16,000 if you wait this amount of time. And in fact, you know, you don't even need to wait 16,000. Wait until it's 30, wait until it's 25. And my algo can tell you how long it's going to take when we are going to reach the bottom and when it's time to buy again, right? You can always wait a little bit, right, to buy your Bitcoin. Now, of course, you say, well, but then is the risk is, is going up, right, and you are wrong. Well, of course, right, there is a risk on everything. But this is a limited risk, right? So you can still do your oddling and your only buy policy, but also maybe understand Bitcoin, you know? It's like if we love Bitcoin, we'll also need it to understand. And I think I found a way to actually understand what really Bitcoin is doing. Now, you have to trust my, uh, you know, my, my understanding and my model, but uh, there is space also for Odler in this approach. So everybody can help, uh, can be helped by this knowledge of, uh, yeah, of the cycles. Yeah, that's why I'm really interested in it because you can always like have a DCA plan, but still buying right. chunks uh, here and there. Yeah, um, exactly. maybe let's... We, we have these strategies called weighted DCA. So we are going to give a weight to the different phases of where you are. In fact, right now we are even developing this terminology. We'll explain it in a more, you know, later of a clock. We can tell you what is a Bitcoin time in the cycle. And according to where we are in the clock, you can give up weight, right? I'm going to buy more when we are here and I'm not going to buy much here and so on. So you don't have to buy and sell, uh, even if that is a, a possible approach. You can also just simply buy at the right time, you know? So it's also good for ordering. Maybe let's start right into it. Like yes. what is the, the power law um, outside of Bitcoin? Because it's a thing outside of Bitcoin also. Yes. Uh, what is it in, 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 in the most simple in, terms? Okay, sure. So, you know, I am a physicist. That is my background, right? Uh, and uh, uh, so physics is uh, the study of nature, right? This, in fact, what, this is what it means. Physics means nature. And so um, we want to understand different patterns in nature, right? Usually... Uh, if we want to express it in with some kind of mathematical formula, right? It's like, like a relationship between things. And then once we found find a particular pattern and the mathematical formula that describe uh, this uh, particular phenomena, we want to understand it. We want to go deeper and try to see why it's behaving in this way. But, you know, the first step is always finding these relationships, right? So, for example, I use this all the time because it's, Probably the first time that scientists talked about some kind of a power law. I think actually it was another example, and uh, um, and that example was Galileo. So we can also use that. So let me give you a couple of uh, historical examples, right? So the first historical example was Galileo, 
So he, you know, from my country, I'm Italian. He's also, you know, it's like he kind of actually created the field of physics. He's, he was the first one. He also came up with this uh, idea of a scientific method, you know, how to explore something with a scientific approach and different steps to do that. So uh, he, he, he understood, he was studying animals. And you see, at that time, you know, there was still this Aristotelian way of looking at the world. You know, there was like a, making analogy. Uh, it was not as scientific uh, as Galileo did. He, he actually has this famous phrase that says, nature is a book and is written in the language of mathematics. So beautiful, right? Because it really applies to what we are discussing here. So in this case, what uh, in, in the power law, what uh, he was trying to understand how animal size up. In fact, actually, this is a very good example, also in terms of this idea of sizing up. What sizing up means, right? So if I study something that goes from being a small thing to a, a something that is much larger, I'm not interested in small little changes. I want to see what happens when, you know, the animal becomes maybe, you know, 10% bigger, 20% bigger, 30% bigger. Oh, you know, if you have something that also changed by a lot, like, for example, Bitcoin, right? They went from being a few cents to almost $100,000, right? That uh, every time it changes by a factor of 10, so it goes from 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100,000, and so on, that is size, you know, that is one term. The other term we use is scale, you know, the scale. So if you focus, if you try to forget the details, but you look at these large ch changes and try to see what happens, maybe like, in, for example, you're looking at time in this case, how, the, how much time it takes to change, right? Uh, or maybe a relationship between two things. Like, for example, in the case of Galileo, he was looking at how big an animal... Um, how big an animal becomes uh, as it grows. And he realized that basically, you know, I know we make this joke in physics that we call them the spherical cows. You know, like uh, if you are trying to understand a cow, make it to a sphere, you know, initially at least. Later you can go into details, but initially think it as a sphere because sphere is so simple to describe, right? It's an approximation. So let's, if you imagine an animal be, being kind of a blob thing, right, and sphere, uh, you know, a sphere, a spherical cow, <laughs> and the cow grows, you know, it grows with, let's say, with the radius, right, bigger the radius, bigger the cow, and then with what uh, quantity exactly? Well, the cube, right, because a volume, the volume of the cow grows with the cube, right? So, and mass is the same, right? B bigger the volume, if the density is the same, uh, bigger the mass, right? And mm -hmm. so, and and it's going up with the cube. So, if I, for example, double the size of the animal, the mass of the animal doesn't go up by a factor of two. It goes by a factor of eight because it's two to the three, right? If I, if the animal becomes three times, then I have to take the three to the to the cube, right? Uh, so three, 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 right? So that is uh, twenty-seven. So you see. Um, it's important to understand how something scales in terms of the power. You see, the power here is the cube. Okay, so this is one of the clues to understand uh, power laws. Uh, and this is why they are called power, because we are talking about some quantity raised to the power, right? And the power can be two, three. Like, for example, volume goes up with the cube. What about the area? The area, for example, of the feet of an animal, right? The animal needs to walk, and usually, like in our case, our feet touch the ground, right? And that is the area of the animal. Uh, and that area, how does it grow? It doesn't grow with a cube, it grows with the square, right? Mm -hmm. Because this is what our what R is. So this is another relationship that goes with the power of the quantity that we're looking at. And so he realized that as an animal grows, there is kind of a ratio, right? That is basically how much weight the animal will have on this on the foot, right? On on his bones. Because uh, the bones uh, they need to make contact with the ground, right? So it's a question of the volume over the area, 
right? So actually that relationship uh, R cube over R square, we get R, right? So the anim as the animal becomes bigger and bigger, this relationship between mass and the surface on which an animal can walk, it goes up linearly, right? So it's a straight line in a, in a graph. And, you know, if I do uh, this quantity, that is the ratio between the, vo the mass and the surface area of the animal, right, that has contact with the ground, if you, if you take this uh, ratio, it goes up, right, with linearly, right? These two quantities. So there is the R cube and R square. I can make a graph of these two quantity and I get some kind of straight line. And whenever you have a relationship of this kind where there is one quantity changing in relationship to another with some kind of a power, you can visualize it better by taking a graph of the log of one quantity versus the log of another. So this type of graph, that not many people are familiar, but in physics we are very familiar with, is called a log-log graph. And if something has the type of relationship I, that I described, that depends on the power, then it looks like a straight line. And this is what happened also with Kepler, I was mentioning, because, uh, you know, in this case, I, I tell this story all the time, because actually, in a sense, this where uh, really this idea of plotting things in a log-log graph started. Uh, he was looking for a pattern in the universe because he thought that the planets were not moving just by chance, but because it was some kind of underlying law. You know, he was not aware of the law yet. He, you know, again, he, he remember this was uh, the beginning of science, so we were still influenced by all these uh, ancient ideas, uh, you know, about uh, uh, planets moving in perfect orbits. And, you know, they had all kind of mystical idea about the universe. But, you know, he wanted to start to use math to actually understand if it was a very a specific pattern. And so he tried many different things. And finally, because log was uh, something, the log, uh, you know, the log basically, what the log does, so if I have, a, let's say, log of 10, right, that is this function, and that apply to a number like 100, it gives me the power. So 10 to the 2 is 100, right? And so if I take the log 10 of 10 to the 2, the answer is 2. If I take the log of 1,000, because 1,000 is 10 to the 3, the answer of that operation of taking the log is 3, and so on. So you see, it's almost like I'm asking through the log, what is the size of this number? Right? And it gives me, it gives me the power. The power is the size, right? So he did this thing. He took uh, the distance of the planets from the sun because they knew, right? They had hundreds of century and century observations of the planets, of the move and so on. So they had all this very detailed information all on paper. It was crazy. You know, they did all this. They didn't have computers at the time. We had to do everything on paper very carefully, very accurately. I don't know how they did it because, you know, Modern scientists don't have that feeling. We do everything by computers. Uh, and, and so he, he, he measured, right? He wrote down the numbers associated with the distance of the, uh, of the planets. And, and he took the log of this distance. And then on the y axis, he had uh, the time, the log of the time. Oh, you know, you can do the other way around. It doesn't matter. Uh, the log of time. Right, but in fact, let me put it in the y axis on the x axis because it's what they did with Bitcoin. So he put the log of time in the in the x axis, and uh, um, and the time in this case is the time that it takes the planet to go around the sun. Right. So when he did that, he was shocked because he, he could see this beautiful organized. I have a graph that I can sh show you in a moment. Beautiful organized line. You know, all the planets were little dots, and you could, like, draw. There are mathematical techniques to draw these lines, but in that case, you could draw it by hand. You could just join the dots because they were so perfectly along this line that you could do it by hand, almost. And, and he was shocked. And then, because he knew the mathematics, he could write a formula that tells you how long a planet takes to go around as a function of its distance, or vice versa, right? So if I know how long it takes a planet uh, 
uh, to go because this is usually what you observe. You look at this planet, you see when it comes back uh, in the same spot of the sky. Some of the planets take years and years. You have to be very patient. Jupiter takes 12 years, right? Imagine being there every night for 12 years, like a Bitcoin. It took 12 years, right? 15 years. And in one, in one big, more than the life of Bitcoin, and Jupiter comes back, right? And you, then if you have that information, even if it is a, no, a, a planet that you never saw before, because of this law, you can say, oh, I know how long it takes to go around the sun. I know the distance now. Even if you may not measure it, because, because there is this law, all the planets then follow it. And so by that time, right, so it's several hundred years, we found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these power laws everywhere in nature. So it's not really like, oh, that is the main thing about physics, but it's really a big chunk, like a lot, a lot of phenomena. And the, the interesting thing, right, so in physics, we really like when we see what is called universality. So different phenomena that don't seem like what Bitcoin has to do with the planets, right? And this is one of the things that I hear all the time from people that don't know science or they don't know physics. What has, what is like corresponding? Why there is any uh, relationship? Well, because ex we, what we do in physics is exactly that. We look for, oh, you know, this thing behaves like this other. They have the same behavior. So in a sense, we are the same. Like for example, waves, right? This is another thing that uh, we study in physics, uh, the waves in the sea the sound you know, that we hear, that is a wave, the la light is a wave, right? Very different level of abstractions of a wave because, you know, usually you don't see light as a wave, but it is a wave, it is a wave. And this is what we, in physics, we get really, really excited when we see this universal pattern, different phenomena that behaves very similarly and they can describe the same laws. You know, it, it gets excited. I don't know, we, you know, we are a, a bunch of nerds, but it's really important because, uh, you know, um, once you understand the formula behind, then you can say how these things behave. You know, you can use the same equations and say, yeah, you know, sound and light are very different, but, you know, they behave like a wave. So I can calculate the speed. I can calculate all the properties of a way. I can tell you how much energy they carry, you know, because it's the same formula. So this why this why it's very powerful to see these uh, similarity. And power laws is one of the keys that allows us to make a lot of connections because, you know, there are phenomena in nature, like, you know, how rivers form, how mountains grow. Like the other day uh, I was showing in my ex account how, you know, there is this article that had a very beautiful graph of how teeth grow. Teeth grow in a power law. If I make a graph of the size of a tooth and then time, how much time uh, the animal is, uh, you know, for how long the animal is growing, uh, for how long the tooth is growing, and they do a log of the size of a tooth and the log of time, right, of growth, it's a beautiful power law. And there are different power laws for different animals. So you can actually use it as a fingerprint. This animal has this slope, you know, because there are different slopes, right? If there are different lines, you will have a different slope. Because that slope, it turns out to be the power. Is the, you know, if you measure the slope, is actually the quantity they told you, right? The, the equation usually is like y equal the quantity x to the power, to the n. And that n is the slope of a straight line. And that end tell us a lot of information. I made a, po a, a, a post the other day that was very, very popular because I was explaining how if you look at metabolism and the size of the animal, you get, a, again, a beautiful straight li line for many different animals. And the fact that that end is three over four, it tell us a lot of things, you know. And uh, people can go on X and look at my post or, you know, we can spend a couple of minutes to explain if, uh, if you are interested. But, uh, uh, so, so this is the general idea of power law. They come up in nature many times. It's this relationship, very simple relationship, but it has a lot of consequences in terms of how things happen, how the metabolism of an animal uh, works, uh, how mm -hmm. um, scaling and changing size uh, when we grow, you know, uh, how planets move around. So, so many, many different things that are described by 
different simple laws, and it doesn't matter if it's simple. We have these other cases. Oh, it's so simple. It's so silly. You know, it's well, this our nature likes it. You know, nature likes simple things, economical things. It's trying to do something even more simple and direct and efficient way. You know, it doesn't I mean, need to be complicated. Uh, and I, I totally get now the, the whole power law and how it's connected to nature. And when we now talk about Bitcoin and the power law, for me, it's the one question in mind, like there's the human side of things. Like what does happen when like Apple, for example, tomorrow comes out and says, uh, we are now buying with all our reserves Bitcoin. I mean, it's unrealistic, but um, how does uh, the human brain uh and the human factor work in this power law and why does Bitcoin still follow this power law? And can there yes. something break this power law in Bitcoin? Okay, very good question. So in general, let me say, let me answer why this power law actually come up in human behavior because Vedo is not just Bitcoin. Right? So you will say, hey, Bitcoin is not a force of nature. I use this slogan that I know it's, as is limitation because you know it's not really a force of nature in the sense that it is something that comes from directly from the natural world. First of all, humans are part of the natural world, so it's still nature. Uh, how humans behave as a group, you know, why not? And second, um, we find these uh, power laws also in social phenomena. These again. Uh, famous uh, Italian e e sociologist, e economist, uh, his name is Pareto, probably you heard about him. Right? For example, income distributions are, uh, if you take you know, how much a person has in terms of income and you look at how many people have that type of income and you organize them and so on, you get a power law and it's called the Pareto distribution. You know, he discovered it, there is a very precise, like you will say, how is possible, right? People probably have random uh, salaries, etc. It's a human phenomenon. Right? Maybe, you know, these countries, different. Yeah, different countries will have different slopes. And again, you can use it almost like something specific for that country, almost like a fingerprint. But we still follow that. You know, it's also called the rule of 80-20 because it turns out... 80% of the people, sometimes, you know, in some countries, even worse, but 80% of the people, sorry, 20% of the people own 80% of the resources. And that happens in so many different phenomena, like, uh, for example, in social media, you know, 20, 80% of the posts come from 20% of the people, you know, this law tell us a lot of things. So you will think, how is possible that human beings behave in that way? You know, in social media, people do whatever they want. They are free to do. Well, I'm not sorry. This is how it happens. Because when people start to interact, etc., they follow certain laws. You know, why that happens? Well, it's much more complicated with human beings. We don't know exactly the interaction, etc. But somehow, they organize themselves to create this law. And you can see them in how cities behave. Like, for example, this is something relatively new in the last maybe 20 years. There was, in particular, there is this uh, physicist called Jeffrey West, and he has beautiful TED Talks. Maybe you can link it in your video. Uh, where uh, And also books and paper, of course, right? He's a scientist. He published a lot. Of, it's not just a scientist going around talking about stuff. Uh, you know, you usually write papers, you know, scientific, or the scientists analyze. So it's a very well accepted field. It's not just a random guy. Uh, it's an entire field of study where people look at cities, how city organized. For example, look at the number of gas stations. You know, you will think the number of gas stations in a city, it's just random, right? This city has a little bit more, but these others, are, are, you know, fewer. Maybe, you know, yes, it's proportional to the size of a city. But, you know, I don't expect to see a very precise law. No, there is a such a precise law. Same thing with income, same thing with uh, patents that the city produces, same thing with, uh, you know, hundreds of different type of things that you look, they are all organized as power law, power law, power law. Almost to the point where, you know, I, I made a joke, I say, and, you know, it's, it's all about power law. It's, it, it has been all about power law. It, yeah, it is, you know, a lot of things. And with Bitcoin, in a way, is surprising because when you see it with your own eyes because one thing is what the theory says and the other when you actually see it it's amazing because 
you know, first of all, is there and is undeniable. And second, you know, it's you're thinking about say, of course, because Bitcoin is a network, and networks hold and behold. You know, when you have interaction between different agents, and this is how we call them in uh, in physics. You know, different things that interact with each other in different way, right? And be, People that talk about Bitcoin, the miners, how the miners interact with the, the, the people that trade the Bitcoin. It's a big interactive network, right? Uh, literally, because there are all these nodes around the planet that are running the protocol, etc. You always, almost always, you see power laws expressing. And you can even go through the map and show that, yes, you will see power laws. And, and then you say, well, but... What if uh, there is something big, you know, like the ETF? What if uh, Apple, like you say, right, it starts to adopt uh, Bitcoin uh, because they allow it uh, to use it uh, their Apple store or whatever, you know, Facebook adopts it, uh, Elon Musk or whatever. It's usually these things do not change the behavior, like, you know, like you in a city will say, well, what if in a city, and at a point, they invite a big corporation to come in, right? They, like, you know, remember there was a time when, uh, um, I, I don't remember if it was Apple or some other, big, maybe Google, you know, they were looking for another headquarters, right? And there are different city competing with each other. What if that city gets Google coming in in the town? Will not that change everything, the dynamics of this power law? Really, usually not really. Because, you know, what happens? The company moved there because the power law, what was at the right place that to go to the next step yeah. needed something like Google to come in, right? It's almost like the power law attracts, you know, because it's, it's, it's a sign of how evolved the city is, how wealthy the city is. Now, there are some exceptions. If a big company like Google come in in a small little town, you know, that creates some kind of big change, etc. And that also is part of the theory how very dramatic changes can affect uh, a network, right? But usually it, it's very rare. And this is why you see these power laws, because if it happens all the time, we will not see them, right? We will see just disrupted power laws. Instead, usually it's the other way around. If a network is ready for a, the next big event, then that event comes. But for Bitcoin, is a beautiful story because... If you think what happened, right, in these 15 years, in the beginning was nothing. It, you know, it was just Satoshi and some crazy cryptographers, you know, in a very small little corner of the internet doing their little things about hacking, you know, white hacking and thinking about cryptography and stuff like that. He created this thing. His friends, say, some were skeptical, some were supporting. They come together, you know, they start to share ideas. Then Satoshi launch the code, some people run it uh, on their computer, they use some of their resources, they debug it, and this makes the network grow. More people hear about it, they come in, they start to, tra you know, to trade it between themselves. Somebody buys a pizza with thousands of Bitcoin, you know, all these events, all these events, right? Uh, the, you know, media start to talk about Bitcoin. So all these things are happening and it's basically like a feedback loop, like this, right? So something happens, uh, it brings the resources, the resources make the network work, uh, go up and grow, the, that attracts more resources, and so on and so on. These, the, when you have effects like that, that uh, we call them in, in um, physics, we call multiplicative, because you, know, you have something, then it's multiplied by the effect of another, then it's multiplied. So you have, like, instead of summing things, you multiply them. That is exactly when you, you will expect a power law. This is why I'm, I'm saying to everybody, look, I'm not just drawing a stupid straight line through data. There is an entire philosophy. There is an entire understanding. If you all get this principle, then you understand a lot of things of Bitcoin. It's almost like a key, like a lot of a question that you have about Bitcoin. What will happen with the ETF? My answer is nothing. You see, I'm very different from many people. Because I'm saying this based on some principle that I could be wrong, and we will see what the data shows. But if this principle is, I am trying to be consistent with this principle, then I can answer all these questions. And you can actually make predictions. You can, for example, you can say, when is, when, how many years are we are going to wait before 
Bitcoin catches up with gold and becomes more valuable than all the gold on earth. Because of this principle and because of these ideas and because of the mathematical laws that governs Bitcoin, that seems to be true, I can make this prediction. See? So it's an entire philosophy, an entire understanding of the history of Bitcoin, of the future of Bitcoin, of the nature of Bitcoin. Once you understand it as a power law, first of all, if you like math, if you like, you know, principles, etc., it's so fantastic because, you know, it's not a random asset. It's so weird. You know, we have this incredible asset that for the first time in human history is not just random. It follows a very precise path, right? So it's a beautiful, interesting thing. Even if you are not interested in Bitcoin, just studying it and trying to understand it, it's beautiful. This, there is no other way to describe it. If you like math and physics, etc., you find it beautiful. You know, it's organized. So people resist it. But if I am right, and this is true, the consequences are incredible, you know, in terms of this social experiment, you can call it a social experiment, a physics experiment, because, you know, we use energy, we transform energy to create this uh, asset, you know, uh, to create value in the network. And so it's really fascinating and, and it's powerful. It's uh, f for me still a fascinating thing to to that Bitcoin follows models, and we have from the past we have the stock to flow model. I think this is something that uh, is really popular in the in the Bitcoin scene uh, lately. Not that much, but it was really popular. Maybe it becomes again really popular, and all these um, models and now also the power law. Uh, tries to kind of predict where the price is going with different mm -hmm. kinds of methods. Um, the power law is really interesting because it's the first one for me, and I'm I'm not a physicist. I have I only a, I'm a software developer, so I have uh, not, not that much understanding of all that uh, nature and all the, those uh, meth uh, methods. But as I understand, this is the first one that's like tied to nature and for me bitcoin is also really tied to nature and when i now ask the question to you like uh, how can we predict the price of bitcoin and if we now have the last 15 years as a record where it follows the uh, price model uh, the, the the power law uh, where will Bitcoin stand in like 15 years? When will we break the 1 million US dollar barrier? Um, and also an, another interesting question is, it, is that power law denominated in US dollar the same thing denominated in, I don't know, Zimbabwe dollar, uh, Venezuelan dollars? Is there a difference in, in those kinds of um, smaller and even uh, less powerful uh, fiat currencies? Very good questions. Okay, so one by one. So the first one about model. So yes, it's a great thing that actually you can study Bitcoin and try to make prediction. And actually, believe me, it's not just uh, me and uh, Plan B that are doing these things, uh, like with some kind of methodology, because of course, you know, you can always draw a line, you can do TA, etc. And most of the time, it doesn't work because it's mostly based on humans trying to find patterns where they are not because this is how we are programmed right it's a very good thing we are kind of machines we're trying to find pattern because this is what allows us to survive but many times we do mistakes you know we see uh, you know jesus on a toast you know like oh look at this it looks like jesus or you know you see something in the clouds you know when there is nothing in the clouds so people can do that but you know if you have a methodology then you at least you are on something like, for example, as the S2F model, it had some value because it had some understanding of cause, you know, like this is what makes the price goes up. But, you know, this is the mechanism, the uh, amount of Bitcoins that are mined because of the halving event goes by down by a factor of two. So I'm thinking that this is what is going to happen. So, you know, I am more actually with i know it received a lot of criticism and people got disappointed and i think it is what is happening also a little bit with my mother because people got tired and disappointed by s2f and you know they are kind of resisting by telling everybody that actually we have cracked bitcoin we have a model that works and i mean if i show you a slide uh, some of the recent things they did 
I think really I cracked it. You know, it really behaves exactly like I'm saying it is behaving. Uh, and not, not just in the general trend, but, you know, even in all the different phases of a cycle. But, um, you know, it's, this is how you do science. You come up with an hypothesis. Remember what I told you, Kepler tried many different things before he found the right thing. You know, this is how you go. Like uh, Edison, you know, he was trying literally thousands of different materials for his light, light bulb, for the filament, and they were all failing until he found the right one. You know, tungsten, for example. Uh, so he, this is how you do science. You try, you explore, and it's beautiful that the Bitcoin is actually study because if you go online, actually, and you go on Scholar, you know, where we have all the scholarly articles, you find really hundreds of papers on Bitcoin. People are studying it as a scientific topic. Maybe Bitcoiners are not uh, aware of it, but actually they should. It's actually, there are serious scientists that study Bitcoin. And in fact, there are even si serious scientists that found power laws. Like they, I always mention all these, these uh, one of my favorite financial physicists is actually pretty famous. His name is Sornet. He's a French scientist. And he actually published a couple of papers where uh, it's all about power laws. He, he found actually one of the first power laws that they found was a power law that I found four years before, but I didn't publish a paper. Instead, I I was silly and they wrote on, on Reddit. <laughs> I should have <laughs> published a paper instead of spending my time on Reddit and, and social media. But, you know, this is how I did it. And they published the paper because usually, you know, you cannot publish exactly the same thing that somebody else published, unless, you know, unless you make an improvement or something. But, you know, they didn't know about my work because, uh, you know, it's on Reddit, and so they don't read Reddit. They are serious scientists. They, they're not like me, but uh, I'm playing with kids and, you know, talking a lot. <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's fun, and I like it. It's also educational, you know, but it's okay. But just to tell you, right, it's a scientific topic. Power laws came about with Bitcoin before serious scientists mentioned them. But then I mentioned this specific one that I mentioned, which is time itself being a power law with price. And, uh, um, and so, you know, the beauty of doing something in time is that if uh, you're right and your equation, you basically you come up with an equation of how the coin develops in time, then I can plug in in that equation any future time, right? And so this is how I can make a prediction. I have an equation that describes the behavior. Now, you have to understand what it means. In this case, for example, we're looking at the median price, you know, the kind of the average price of Bitcoin, right? We are not trying to predict exactly where it is day by day, but in average, where the in average the price is going. And again, remember the emphasis on scale. We are not caring about, you know, is it 50,000 or 53,000? You know, to me, it's the same thing because remember, I want to focus on how the price scales up, right? So is it 50,000 or 100,000? You know, is uh, 10 or, 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 you know, 50s in between, so okay. So, but you know, it's much more precise than that. But in general, we are trying to understand how we go to the next level of 10. Does it take five years? Does it take 10 years? Does it take 100 years? You know, that is this entire thing about power laws. Uh, it's the focus on scale. So, you know, there are many differences between S2F and the power law. Of course, I believe the power laws are more powerful. You know, me and Plan B are talking. We want to do at a certain point like a public public debate, you know, where we discuss the pro and cons. I admire him and I think he's great. I think he got uh, too much negative publicity when his model didn't work because people got disappointed. There was some controversy there. I think he was at a certain point maybe got excited and he was kind of hyping, you know, what was uh, going to happen, you know, because his model is very optimistic. He is, is basically an exponential. So every four years, according to his model, we go up by a factor of 10. And, you know, so this cycle, for example, S2F uh, predicts basically we are going close to a million. My prediction, right, because you were kind of asking what my model predicts is more like 210,000 for the cycle. It's much more sober. It's much more because, you know, there is growth, but the one of the messages, because there are a lot of messages associated with the power law, is that it takes longer and longer for Bitcoin to grow. You know, most of a very fast growth happened in the beginning, and now we are slowing down. And everybody kind of kind of see that, right? Because we don't see that explosive growth. It's the same growth, right? Strangely enough, because uh, 
but because it has to do with size, it to, you know, the, the analogy is this. If he, you know, if he took, let's say, took, a, you know, 100 days for Bitcoin to go from one to $10. Next step to go from 10, you know, to, let's, what do they say, from 10 to $100, right? To go from 100 to 1,000, so it's a next step of 10, it takes a proportional amount of time. So instead of, you know, 100 days, it's going to take 1,000 days. So, you know, we're talking about years, right? Because thousands of days is kind of almost like three years, right? So it, it, this is the, the idea of it, uh, to go to the next step, it takes longer and longer and longer. So for example, how long is it going to take to reach a million? Well, it's going to take 2033. That is what the calculation of a model says. We should reach 1 million around 2033. Now, if you if you if S to F is right, because this cycle actually we will see if S to F is completely wrong, because it looked kind of wrong last cycle, but this time this new cycle will really decide between all these models. You know, and again, it's something that happens in science. As you get more data, some of the old models die, and it's almost like a battle of the models. You know, some model gets put aside because we were wrong. That you know, like a the Earth being the center of the universe, you know, it turned out not to be true. We went to the heliocentric model, right? So uh, as you get more data and more information and knowledge, many different models can be excluded, you know? So I think this is what will happen with this new circle and S2F. Uh, I think his model is wrong, mostly because the exponential growth doesn't look like what his Bitcoin is doing. And also, do you know what? Again, because all this is a philosophy, power laws are associated with something that is stable, that is strong, that is uh, anti-fragile. You do it something to it, it wants to go back to where it was before. So I prefer to work with Bitcoin really follows a power law because even if it takes longer for us to go you know, to millions of dollars, it shows that the system is robust, is strong, is going to last for a long, long time. And things that move exponential, they don't. They usually go fast, 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 and then they crash or they, something really dramatic happens to them. So, you know, we will see because whatever it, Bitcoin does or whatever Bitcoin does, right? I, I cannot force it to do a certain thing. But, you know, again, I think the power law gives us a completely different perspective. As to f is part, you know, and by the way, I'm doing model much, much earlier than... Uh, plan B. I started this in 2012, all the way. So, you know, it's not that I'm trying to copy what uh, Plan B is doing with something different. You know, I'm doing this much earlier than him. But, you know, like I say, I think there is so much more, so much more interesting principle, ideas, and they are all consistent. And, all you know, even this idea of time, for example, that we have to wait for good things to come, right? So you, you read the Bitcoin standard, right? And remember that there is that com concept of preference, time, time preference, right? And, and there is the idea that uh, it's it's a good thing to wait, you know, for uh, gains and for uh, good things to happen, right? And so I, I make a joke all the time that, uh, yeah, it's actually for Bitcoin, it's it's not preference time, but preference log time, right? Because I'm taking the log of time. So it's kind of a joke, but it makes you think about what is beyond, that if you want to really, if you care about this system and we want to support the network and for us, you know, it's a tool for freedom, etc. We want it, you know, like a plant, you know, that is growing with its own patterns and is going stronger and stronger, you know, instead of, being selfish and want that Bitcoin goes up like an exponential and we make millions very quickly. I rather hope that uh, Bitcoin, it's like that key that waits for the cookies, you know, that uh, is taking his time and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to wait because now, now I'm going to get two cookies instead of one, right? So you see how the philosophy changes. We are almost like opposite in a way, uh, S to F and the power law. There are like two different models that say different things, you know, uh, all opposite things. Yeah, I like uh, your approach to it because it seems like an, uh, a connected to something real 
it seems like low time preference. It seems like not a hype model where you like predict, oh, at this date, uh, the price will be at 1 million. It's like, uh, no, we're having a, uh, an, a power low. And this is what it seems like. And you also mentioned it uh, in the beginning somewhere that uh, there can be exceptions. Like, for example, I don't know, uh, in... Uh, in the in the COVID area, actually, it happened in Germany, where the the company who built he, who was uh, doing the manufacturing of the COVID vaccines, uh, he was that was in a smaller uh, town, and they are now bringing in so many taxes because of one event. Like probably this is something it's a, a little bit of an exception to like something like a power law, but as Bitcoin also grows, it seems like. Uh, exceptions to the power law can be happen um, um, not as 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 fast. Like uh, the more Bitcoin grows, the harder it gets for it to to break. Like you know, like this, exactly, exactly, uh, exactly. The beginning so when you start to see you. You started to be a fellow physicist. You're starting to think <laughs> like a physicist. Yeah, you know? this, this is good. This, this is this why. You know, I wish everybody study physics. You know, they should. It's a martial. I call it sometimes the martial art of science. You know, <laughs> it really trains you. We have even experiment. They show that when students take physics classes, their brain changes because it's so different from thinking from everything else. You start to see patterns. You start to reason in a very systematic way. You know, you say, okay, yeah, great. Yeah, like you did right now. You say, yeah, the system is bigger. And I'm talking about some kind of feedback loop of uh, action, reaction. Of course, it's going to go slower because it takes much more to go from, you know, 100,000 to a million, you know. Uh, and also exceptions will not be so important. You know, there will be little, uh, there will be some reaction, but it will not be as dramatic as before, you know. And we see that. We see in so many things, even these bubbles, you know, these... Uh, times when uh, after the halving the price goes away actually from the power law it's a uh, i i that again i try to be consistent with my philosophy i see it almost what a physicist is called like a perturbation you know it's like a you have a you know like a, a branch of a tree but you know it stays there it's stable and then i go he and hit it and what it does it starts to vibrate right and then little by little because of the frictions inside the tree and uh, you know the fibers inside the tree they create friction it loses that amplitude and it goes back to where it was before and so that is exactly what happened with the bitcoin because if you see what happens with the bubble i can show you again in one of the graphs you see the response to the halving the price goes up like crazy and then it reaches the top and it goes back and you know where it goes exactly along the trajectory of a power law it goes back there how does it do it i don't know but it does it you know it's a fact it's there in the graph you know it's a scientific thing and it shows that the system is robust it's a, yes it can react to changes but it then goes back to equilibrium same thing with physiology if i run my heartbeat will go up you know it will, it's kind of a perturbation in the system but then because what is called M homeostasis, you know, the system wants to go back to equilibrium. You see, again, this understanding of Bitcoin as a power law also allows you to understand how the cycles work. It's all consistent. You know, it's all part of the story. And it's not, you know, it's not a, like a little BS story, you know, that I'm making up. It's all based on data. It's all based on science. It's all based on... Now, could, could I be wrong? Yes, because some of these things that maybe... I see, maybe are not there, you know, but this we have a tool now to go and answer this question in a more scientific way, you know, and and, and understanding Bitcoin as this kind of process that follows a power law. So, yeah, and uh, can that happen in the future in Bitcoin? It could happen, you know, maybe there is some dis disastrous event, you know, like, uh, in, and, and sorry if I kind of skip over a question you were talking about, different currencies you know so what happened i didn't do it yet because i'm doing so many things and coming up with so many ideas i spend all actually almost all my day doing these graphs because it doesn't look like it takes time but it does you have to code you have to understand you have to adjust the graph you know to make it nicer to make it look more 
understandable for people. So it takes a long time for me to work on this. It's, I'm, I'm very excited. I cannot wait to wake up and and work and see how people like it and how they respond. It's really interesting. Uh, it's it's the love of my life right now, you know. But um, um, you know, I didn't do the currencies because it, there were other things. The dollar is really good a good way because we are talking about value. Most people in the world use still the dollar as a currency. You know, it's very stable. Inflation, inflation, it's relatively small. Uh, it will be interesting to see how it behaves with different currency. But it's really, I don't know what we could learn from that. You know, besides, okay, this currency crazy, and uh, you know, maybe the power load is not there anymore when uh, uh, you have a, a very inflationary currency. I, I will do it because. It's interesting and it should be done, but uh, I don't know yet. I saw some graphs that other people show of uh, how crazy it looks, like it looks almost exponential. But see, at that point, it's not power law anymore. I mean, it's not Bitcoin anymore. It's really the co currency that is losing value in an almost exponential fashion. So that effect dominates over the growth of Bitcoin itself. It, it looks like Bitcoin is growing, but really it's the currency that is losing value, you know? Uh, that is what Bitcoin does. You know, it, it, it makes you your stupid currency look like crazy if uh, if if you trade it in Bitcoin, right? But uh, I don't know if there is a really a pattern there. We we can look at it, but I, my guess is that it's dominated by the currency losing value. You know, with uh, with dollar, it's a small correction. In fact, the other day I posted because I say this many times: a small correction, a small correction. But uh, I really didn't show a graph, and then finally I show a graph, and you can see from that graph in my uh, Reddit post that uh, it basically almost didn't change at all. You know, while if you do the same thing with uh, SP500, for example, in an equivalent amount of time, it lost almost half of its value. So it's already not much because you know, like in the last, uh, you know, almost like 20 years. SP500 went up like four times, you know, and it seems, oh, maybe it's a big, well, it's not and nothing for Bitcoin because Bitcoin goes up a factor of four in some time in a few months, you know, um, but, um, you know, for a, for a normal investment seems a lot, but you have to cut it enough because you lost half of it by for because of inflation. You know, so it's a really dominant with things like uh, SP500, almost like you're basically catching up with inflation. You're not really making a ton of money. You are all, like, basically preserving your money against inflation. That is not what investment should be about, right? It should not just be about uh, holding something because uh, you beat inflation, but, uh, you know, to create wealth because basically you're saving and you're not doing all the things you would like to do with the money because you want to the future reward. But if a future reward is hey, I just uh, fought inflation, you know, it's really sad. And it tells everything, right? In our philosophy of Bitcoin, that we are against printing money and uh, we all the time complain about inflation, etc. These things that keeps us like slaves. You look at that graph that I just posted, you see it directly with your eyes. Look at this. You know, I invested in SP500, it's supposed to be this incredible investment for 20 years and I barely beat inflation by a little bit, you know, while Bitcoin, you, you are plotting the same graph, Bitcoin, Bitcoin looks like this, you know, like <laughs> really thousands, tens of thousands better than SP500, better than gold, better than anything. It looks like, like you look at the graph, you say, what the heck is happening here? It doesn't even look real, you know? It's crazy. I'm super excited to announce that this podcast got the first ever sponsor 21 bitcoin is bitcoin only from day one and they teach and preach self-custody this is my go-to exchange when someone asks me oh where can i buy my bitcoin from this is the easiest entry for bitcoiners and if you want lower fees plus at the same time support this podcast use code robin and click the link in the description maybe it's now a good time to actually look at the graphs you you mentioned yes. in the, uh, while we we talked and now answer like the all the questions like how is the graph uh, coming along what's the power of of the bitcoin power law yeah yeah and then where we are going and maybe we can also see like okay 
<laughs> when should we cross the you said 210,000 for this cycle so like 210,000 in the, like the next one two years yes and can you see my screen I can see the screen yes bit boy side on and com. yeah this is actually my company so I have a company and I have a goal of a company and so let me see if I can actually make it as a presentation last slide show so I should click here on the power law power law on the PowerPoint, <laughs> I'm so fixated with power laws. With, uh, okay, from the beginning. All right, and, you, and now you see it as a presentation, Yes, now right? I see the slides, yeah. Yeah, so my, my site is called uh, Be Poseidon, and you guys can go there and uh, sign up. We have um, like a little box where you can put your email. We are going to, we are planning to send uh, regular uh, newsletters, uh, you know, to update people, you know, so you, you can actually see it at your own leisure instead of, uh, you know, fo following me also on Twitter. This is my Twitter, by the way. I, I know if this is a crazy name. Uh, I didn't know that you actually could use uh, a, uh, your own uh, tailored name. And because so many different places now link to these, uh, you know, different interviews that I did, etc. I decided not to change it, at least for now. Uh, so, you know, just paste and copy and, or, you know, I know it's a long name, but come and, and uh, see our discussions on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And this site, uh, what this site is about, uh, we are uh, developing an app, actually, because uh, we want to help investors. Uh, and the app will, you know, you basically decide what is your style if you're an hodler, because this approach can also be used by hodler, because basically it's telling you, look, this is a good time to do DCA. Uh, do it very aggressively because the price is very low. We are uh, um, oversold relatively to this uh, general trend. Uh, here is not such a good idea. You know, just wait a little bit until you get actually a lower price. You know, so you, uh, even an order I can use. Or if you want to be aggressive where uh, maybe you want to multiply your Bitcoin and you want to risk where you want to sell maybe 10% of your Bitcoin, 20%, 50%. You know, is, uh, is something that is called rebalancing, right? You sell the asset that is doing very well, you know, to get uh, the one that is not doing. And then because of a cycle, you can rebuy Bitcoin at a lower price. So this app is going to help you with that. Uh, you decide how you want to play the game. And then uh, it's basically doing the buy and selling for you, all automated. Of course, you can check what is doing, the performance, you can control it. But uh, many people, you know, have busy lives, so they don't want to look at a chart all day long. So this, this app can do it for you automatically. Uh, so sign up. We are going to do uh, beta testing very, very soon. So, you know, uh, you can be part of a beta testing if we sign up. And so this is the first graph I wanted to show you. So basically, this is what I say all the time. This is basically what we show on on you know CNBC and all these uh, financial uh, media, uh, they always talk about how Bitcoin went up like crazy and then it crashed and it looks messy. You know, like if you look at this graph, it doesn't look there is a pattern at all, right? It looks like yeah, maybe it's generally going up. You know, we have this going up recently, right? In the last year, but you know if you for example, if we just went through a bear market, it looks sad, right? Oh, we reached 60,000, now we crash to 16s, and, you know, it's the hand of Bitcoin, it's horrible, you know. Uh, this is what they usually show, you know. Uh, they, I never show them, saw them showing a log graph, for example, where, uh, so in this chart, what you see in this chart is, is called a linear chart, because the time, in this case, what I'm showing are the days, how many days are passed by since the creation of Bitcoin? So the, what we call the Genesis block. This is why we have zero, you know, have a Genesis block when Bitcoin was created. Then, uh, you know, these are the number of days from that event, right? Uh, and and basically here is where we are today. Um, I think this, this chart like three or four days ago. And here on the Y axis, we see the price. I know it's in this scientific notation that some people are not familiar. But, you know, we're talking about every mark here is basically 10,000, right? So we have on top 70,000, 60,000, and so on, because 10 to the 4 here means 10,000. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, if you do this chart, but many people are familiar because it looks kind of like, you know, that rainbow chart that everybody's familiar. 
the rainbow chart actually is based on the work of this guy that is called Trollo Law. I would like to meet him one day somewhere in the Bitcoin universe because he, you know, I don't think he, he understood completely what he was dealing with because he doesn't use the word power law. Uh, it comes up with a, a method that is a little bit cumbersome. But his big intuition was, I think we should plot Bitcoin. That is not, you know, a big deal because whenever you have something that changes by, you know, factor of 10, like uh, it happened with Bitcoin. And remember, the, he did it this around 2014. So we were here, you know, when we didn't have a lot of data. Uh, and he decided to plot the graph on a, what is called a log linear. So log in the y-axis, but still linear in the y-axis. Sorry, in the x-axis. You know, the time is linear. It is what most people are familiar with. And so when you do that, even at that time, it looked like there was some kind of a pattern. And uh, and he was trying to say to people, I think I see here something. You know, it's, uh, it looks like, and that was uh, one of the things he was trying to describe. He had a very, very good intuition. So even if he didn't have a language of a physicist, that you know, to call it a power law, uh, he understood that scaling was important. So, and, it, and the scaling was in the X, Y axis. He was focused on, how Bitcoin changes in the y-axis. And they say, look, you know, when I go from zero to one dollar, uh, and so you see here is log, right? so, I, so what this means, you know, when it's a uh, log zero, we are talking about uh, one dollar because 10 to the zero is one dollar, 10 to the one is ten dollar, 10 to the two, uh, hundred dollars, thousand dollars, and so on, right? This, this is what these numbers represent, uh, is the exponent of this dollar prices so he you know when he did it in that way he, he, he started to say see guys i'm looking at how long it takes for bitcoin to go from you know uh, from zero to one dollar to you know to, from from one dollar to ten dollars from ten dollars from an hundred dollar and so on and it looks like it's taking longer and longer time he had a very beautiful graph with all the time that it took to do that and he also projected in the future because uh, he wanted to see what happened in the future so he is kind of a grandfather of this idea right so because this is also how you do science it's not a question oh i was the first you were the second many people come together and everybody has their own little contribution right this is how many scientific fields develop it was you know kepler and then newton and then you know and galileo at the start you know they all contributed something for science to move along. So same thing with the Easter Bitcoin. People started to notice there were very precise regularities, right? I was also active at that time in this field. I was making my own charts. I was already talking about power laws, but I was more focused. I, I, I cared about the price, but I was also, my, the power laws that I was funding were uh, with addresses, with hash rate, with transition. I didn't look at that. Uh, uh, the price directly if the price directly was a power law because i thought it was like kind of a two-step process first you find the power law let's say between addresses and price and then if you know how addresses change you can then do the second step and say our price change right so it was like a two-step process uh and so i was like working there i heard about trollolo's model he was fitting a non-linear fit because you see this is also the other thing that he saw. Remember, he was for here around 2014. It doesn't look very curved, right? If you just focus up to 2014, it looks it kind of looks almost like a straight line. And the straight line in this type of graph is what is called an exponential. So many people were saying that Bitcoin was an exponential, and if it was an exponential, imagine. I draw a straight line just here from you know the beginning to 2014, and I continue that straight line. You know it will be already a million, several years ago, but he didn't do that, right? So he was right in his intuition because when or actually the math because he applied uh, what is called a regression, that basically is a mathematical tool to find is there like basically is answering this question: is there some kind of a curve there? that seems to explain the behavior of Bitcoin. And he came up with a log, that the answer was a log, that the log of price seemed to change with the log of time. And 
I was kind of silly because if I I, I saw that and I should read, I immediately have recognized. But okay, basically you found a power law. <laughs> right? This is a cumbersome way of finding a power law because there is a much more straight way. And what I want to say, one more thing about this chart. You see, even the non-experienced mathematician or physicist looks at this chart and all of a sudden it doesn't look that random anymore, right? It follows a very nice, beautiful arc. It seems to go up, right? Maybe slowing down, right? Because uh, it's curved, it's not straight. If it was an exponential, remember, it would look like a straight line in this kind of graph. The linear graph and exponential looks like a hockey stick. It goes very, very fast. But uh, in a graph like this, it looks a straight line. This is not a power, uh, this is not a, a, an exponential, so it looks curved. So it means it's growing, but it's growing slower than an exponential, right? And it's now stopping because this thing, te in theory, you know, it's like a parabola. It's a very, because uh, remember, I told you that we can extract the exponents when we do this calculation, and the exponent for Bitcoin is 5.82. So it looks basically like a, a parabola, right? Because we know what a parabola looks like, a y equal s square. But instead of having the square, we are having a number that is almost close to six. So it's, you can imagine how fast it's going. So when we're talking about slowing down, it's still a very fast process. It's slowing down relatively to an exponential. Uh, but so I was telling you there is a much more, strength, and this look, these stars are the alvings, right? So we can see some other regularities in this chart. Like every time there is an alving, it seems there is a like, some kind of event where, you know, we call them bubble, the price goes up, uh, shoots up, reaches the top, and then it comes down, right? But you see how nicely, because differently from Trollol, and cetera, this chart is also based on the power law, because I did one step that I will show you in a moment, and then everything looks much more regular when you do that. See, uh, so even in this chart, you can start to see that it doesn't look that random. And people were already pointed out, but you know, we didn't really love the language of a power law because to me that is how things start to be so clear, first of all, and then it's not anymore fitting a line. It's an entire philosophy of Bitcoin and, in fact, life. So, and that is here. Look, this is revealed by this graph. So for a moment, forget about the oscillations here because this is what I added on top. Say, okay, beside doing this is also oscillating. But so if you forget about the oscillations, you can see that something magical happened. Look, stra curve, straight line, right? It looks like a straight mm -hmm. line. And you say, well, there are these deviations. Yeah, a straight line with some deviations where, like I told you before, look what happened here. It deviates, it goes up, then what? After, and how does Bitcoin knows to do that? It comes back. And look what it does. It follows the power law. It follows the bottom. You know, it, it is parallel to the trend and it stays within this channel that is like a deviation from that general trend. The general trend is the orange line. So that is kind of a middle ground. And then you have these regularities like, oh, it looks like a, it goes down to some kind of a deviation, so like a very fixed deviation. It turns out it's about 60% from the trend. And then it stays there. And so I did it also before, you see, and here. And here a little bit, you know, this actually, by the way, is COVID that is a little deep here that you see, you know, uh, in this, uh, in in the, in the cycle after, this is like, a, this is the last cycle, this is the previous one, like in 2018, then, I, then we had a big COVID. And during the COVID, the price went back, you know, to that uh, general bottom trend, right? But it stayed a little bit above, right? But uh, I don't know, maybe there were things, right? These are some of the there are regularities and then there are like little exceptions. But in general, again, you know, the general pattern is followed. And this, see, after the last cycles, again, we see the same thing. The price stays there in this green band, right? That represents like a, a range of different percentages from the general trend, right? In the legend, you can see 20%, 40%, and so on. So... All of a sudden, when I saw these with my training of plotting power laws, and some of them, believe me, are not perfect like the planet. They look ugly. Like if you do, for example, with uh, addresses, it looks much more disorderly, right? But there is still a general trend there where you can say, look, it looks 
it doesn't look completely random. It follows a precise pattern. It's a power law. And, uh, and then, you know, you can actually do this calculation that is a regression that uh, is a finding a straight line. And, and many people say, oh, so you did a regression. What is the big deal? It's not a big deal because uh, most people that have uh, like some basic mathematics skills know how to do regression and the computer can do for you. The point is recognizing that there is something very organized, very structured, that is very unlikely for a, an asset to behave in this way. And in particular, the other thing that I always remind to the critics of, oh, you just did a, a straight line in a graph, it is silly. You are silly if you say that, because look at this, you know, my Italian passion comes out. We went through orders of magnitude. This thing went from being few cents all the way to almost 100,000. And through all these, he behaved in this regular fashion. These cannot happen by chance, okay? No scientist will tell will look at these and tell you this happens by chance. In fact, you know, this uh, uh, Kruger um, person, you know, he's like one of the um, very active uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, accounts. And uh, from what I understand, uh, I like his uh, post, etc. He's a very smart guy. He has a, a PhD from Stanford in math. You look at this graph. I don't know why he didn't find it before, but he looked at the graph and he commented, this is amazing. Bitcoin goes through an unstoppable power law. He understood it. Anybody with any basic understanding of math and physics and some a little in, understanding of science and, and intelligence immediately says, this is, this is interesting. This is weird. And if you do it with other assets, they don't look like that. SP500 doesn't look like that. Uh, gold doesn't look like that. You know, just Bitcoin. And so, it, you know, when I discovered this, yeah, it's not something completely new. There was Trololo, there were other people, but the new thing was, this is a power law. And everything changes all of a sudden because now you have all these other tools that come together in trying to interpret what Bitcoin does, which we already discussed, right? And so... Uh, you know, this was an example that I was telling you before. This is a paper where, uh, see, this a lot of we got also, and at a certain point we were all, you know, when uh, actually S two F came about, they were uh, all these economists coming out. Some of you know probably students or maybe some PhDs and cetera. They were debating about the validity of S two F, but also because uh, there was like a, a this a, a soft, you know, I think is a um, computer scientist uh, he came out very very clever guy he saw my paper not my paper my, my reddit post because that was my mistake to publish on reddit <laughs> he saw my uh, my post and he, also he like being a smart guy immediately was convinced this is striking and he started to uh, post a bunch of uh, medium articles his name is H.C. Berger and he popularized this model you know, and it becomes not as famous as S2F, but it becomes kind of almost a competition. And people were putting it down, like these economists were attacking it. And uh, some of them started to make us fun of us that we are taking the log of time because you see how weird it looks, all these dates bunching up. What these dates bunching up means is because we are taking the log of time, it, it takes longer and longer and longer time for the price to go up by a factor of 10. This is what it means. You have to understand what is going on and come up with the right interpretation. But because these economists are not used to take the log of time of an asset, they got confused. And one, in, uh, one of them in particular was telling us, it's absurd, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It means that time is accelerating. It doesn't mean that time is accelerating. It's simply a way of showing that uh, if you focus on scale, both the price and the time scale in a similar fashion. In a very, we call it in physics, we uh, use this term, a scale invariant. Invariant means it doesn't change. So if I go from 10 to 100 to 1,000, it does the same thing. Because a straight line means a regular, a consistent pace of change, right? So the same thing here. So you can understand what is happening here in this graph. We have time. Oh, look at this, these weird guys, you know, these weirdos that are taking the log of time. We do it all the time in science. I don't know why economists don't know that, 
So it took the time that it takes for the tooth to grow, right? In this case, years. And it, and why this is a log graph? Do you see how the weird scaling, first of all, all this, you know, they are not equally spaced. That is a sign they're looking at the log. And also you see how it grows by factor of 10, right? 10, 50, and so on. And same thing in, in the x-axis. So when you do something like that, that is the main tool, one of the main tools. It's a trick. If uh, uh, there is another thing, people that don't understand math, um, you know, I see on the social media, they say, he manipulated the chart. <laughs> I mean, it's silly, but at the same time, because we are dealing with a lot of people that don't know math, it makes me sad if they say things like that. What, which kind of manipulator? It's called a, a transformation. We do this all the time in physics to show patterns that were not visible when you have a normal type of graph. The fact that this behavior looks like a straight line and a log log graph is significant. It means that is a power law. It's one of the way to recognize it easily because our eyes are trained to look for a straight line. It doesn't mean that you're just basing all your understanding on using your eyes. You then first use your intuition. You look, there is a straight line. It looks like a straight line. Yes, yeah, a little bit tilted, you know, maybe in the beginning, but you know, it really follows kind of like a straight line. So it can be irregular. It doesn't have to be always perfect. But the scientists say it's a look like a power law, yeah, with some deviations, of course, because you know, it's still kind of a random process. But it's significant because then I can come up with all kinds of interesting properties by looking at the exponent. You know, there are ways of thinking and understanding. You know, I can see that different animals have different lines. So, you know, this animal, uh, the tooth grows faster. Why? What is going on in that animal? Why that happens? You know, there are so many things that you can understand and extrapolate by doing this trick. You now, we do it all the time. It's like part of doing science okay so this is very interesting and these are an example but look at this there are tons of other examples all over the place there are these are, are you know for example i have a body mass right and here a metabolic rate and uh, so i was telling you before right let me try to summarize what i was planning in the post the beauty of this graph right first of all look at all these different animals uh, in this graph where uh, they all follow, how the bull knows, you know, where the goose is going to be of a dog. And I, they all organize, even the man and the woman, the woman, look at the woman. So, and uh, there are many things to learn from a graph like this. Like for example, I, all, besides saying, oh, it's a, it's a power law. You can say why the woman is just below the man, right? Well, it seems the man, for example, you know, given the same body mass, if you take a woman and a man with the same body mass, in average, men consume more energy. So actually, women are more efficient, right? So women are more efficient in how using the energy, maybe because when they became pregnant, they have to save energy. So or maybe men need to do like a big effort, you know, to hunt, etc. So in evolution, we change a little bit. Like when I say men and women are the same, no, because this graph shows you that at least from a metabolic point of view, we are not. You know, there is a difference, an important difference. And it, you can actually start to understand a lot of things by just looking at the graph. The other thing I was explaining is that the slope, this is why the slope is so important, is three quarter. That means that is less than one. And what that is the consequence of that? Well, that means that every time I make the animal bigger and bigger, so, you know, you will think I'm making the animal two times bigger. It's going to consume two times the energy. No, because it's the size of the animal. This, this graph means simply that how much energy you're consuming is your mass to the power of three quarter, right? So if I take two to the three quarter, it's, I don't remember exactly by, by heart, but something like 1.6. So it's not quite two. So that means there is some kind of economy of scales, right? So if I triple the animal, it's not going to be three times the energy, it's going to be 2.3, let's say. I, I cannot do that in my head, but if you do it with the calculator, take the power of, you know, three to the power of three quarters, you don't get three, you get something less than three. That means as the animal scales up, becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, 
it's more efficient in using than energy. Do you see how many things we can learn from a power law? This why you see why scientists are fascinated by them? Because just by deriving that little power, we can say so many things about the phenomena that we are studying and also looking at the details of a chart and so on and so on and so on. Then we can think about, okay, what is causing this? Why we see this three quarter? Why is not five, seven, you know? What is going on? Let's try to study and understand how that number comes about and so on. You see, it happens everywhere in languages. Like, look how a language is organized. This is how many times a word appears in a language. All the, like, what Latin and Japanese have anything to do with each other? Well, they follow power law. And every language, see, these are different colors represent different languages. But yeah, there will be differences, but they all kind of stay on top of each other. They seem to follow a very precise pattern. Same thing with cities. You see, here I show cities, different nations, right? And different cities, the different lines here represent the different cities. So it depends on how big the city and how it behaves, etc. And so there are very precise quantities, right? whatever I'm looking at, it could be how the city is growing and whatever, these different type of parameters. Uh, like I say, it works with number of jobs, uh, gas stations, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever, te television stations and in a city, they all follow power laws, power laws, power laws, and the planets that we mentioned, right? And these are just few examples that are literally hundreds. And look, right, when you compare it with everything, look, again, Bitcoin, it follows, like a general trend, looks a straight line. So Bitcoin is also power law. And it follows between all these things, you know. It's incredible. It's like if this is true and it continues to be true, it's probably one of the most fundamental, interesting things about Bitcoin. But for the first time in human history, we have an asset that doesn't behave like a, 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 a um, an asset, random, and it goes up, it goes down, etc. It does locally. But the general trend over many, many, many orders of magnitude, like, you know, basically going from being a mouse all the way to being an elephant, it follows the general power law pattern. It's extraordinary. And if you are not seeing this, I'm sorry for you. I'm very sorry for you. You are not, you don't like science. You don't understand science. And, I, you know, it's sad because it's a beautiful thing, you know, understanding all these, that there are patterns in life and, and in Bitcoin, you know, so uh, and then, you know, this is what I was telling you before. Other scientists, you know, they, they again, sometimes they criticize me. Even to the, last, the other day, there is this uh, this Reddit post that I don't know, you know, has to be like the saddest place on the Internet is called Batcoin, right? B-U-T-T coin. <laughs> yeah. Because these people are, I'm sorry to use the word, but literally idiots because, you know, when it was, they were, I was, talking to them in 2012 when Bitcoin was $9. And, you know, you could still think it was a tulip, etc. But, you know, 15 years later, they say the same thing. It's a tulip, etc. So you're really an idiot because it's not, right? And right now, if you invest in Bitcoin instead of being stupid on the internet, you could be a millionaire because, you know, it went up thousands of times. And, you know, these people continue to say the same bullshit and they were making fun of my model. And I was telling them, look, you know, go and make fun of... Uh, the uh, Sornet, that is one of the most famous uh, physicists in the world, uh, you know, in, in the financial uh, area of physics, uh, and he wrote entire books on how to predict crashes in the stock market. This guy is famous if you if you are in the field, and he they wrote a paper with a co-author where they were they had power laws in Bitcoin. You know, so you're saying that I'm silly to make little regression lines. Well, that is exactly what we did. We took the market cap, we took the active users. By the way, I had a graph like that on Reddit four years before them. And this is why, you know, they were not aware of my work because I published on Reddit instead of a paper, but I did it four years before that. And I showed this, right? See, I told you that the data look messy, you know, because you know, of course there is some randomness. Right? But in general, you can see there is a very general pattern that can be explained by a power law. These guys do a regression in a log log graph. You can make fun of them. They publish a paper. You didn't. And, you know, these are professional scientists. You are not. You know, so maybe maybe they are right. You know, so and you know, then you can actually take this law. Do you remember that I was telling you the two step process? Right. This is what I was trying to do. I was 
looking at the addresses. In fact, I had a Reddit co post called Metcalf law compared with zip law, etc. You know, there are different type of power laws, you know, and there was maybe King the comparison and say Bitcoin kind of follows in between. It's neither zips and neither Metcalf. It looks like uh, something in between. Uh, so I was making all this reasoning by looking at this relationship. So basically what this article is about, and this article is published in a peer review journal. Other scientists look at it. They agreed. It's amazing. You know, okay, you can go ahead and publish. And, you know, and they had a, like a kind of a prediction of a price of Bitcoin. And it's kind of basically <laughs> what I'm saying. It's a very regular pattern that is based on a power law, right? I did it four years before them. They arrived to the same conclusion, you know? So it's good when other scientists kind of support your work, you know, that say, yeah, you know, you are on the right path, you know? Um, this is how you do science, you know? So um, it's not just this crazy physics. It's just I'm trying to say, I did it before many other people, even if I didn't do it in the right platform. And also, I don't care about who did it first. It's just amazing that, uh, so this is the education part of it actually is true. And Bitcoiner should be aware. And not just Bitcoiner, CNBC should be aware. You know, Kramer, Kramer should be aware. Everybody will talk about Bitcoin. You cannot talk about Bitcoin unless you realize that Bitcoin does and behave like a normal asset. So don't talk about your normal way of analyzing asset. You should understand power laws. You should understand that it's different, that it behaves in a very regular fashion and is stable. And I know it's weird because people are not used to this, right? To think that there is an asset that you invest in it and you know what it's going to do 10 years from now. It's, yeah, it sounds weird, but it is like, uh, like this. And, you know, these are not other graph that we did. Like, for example, we did like other things. Other people say, oh, but you didn't do all very deep statistical analysis to show that is a power. We did. We did a lot of different, you know. And this where, for example, I work with Burger, you know, where uh, we you know, wrote different articles. We should write, actually, real scientific paper, right? That is my next step. I want to put all this together and write in a paper. But we did a lot of analysis to show that, you know, this graph, what this graph is trying to show, like one question is, what if I uh, did this model five years ago? What if I did it six years ago? What did I did 10 years ago? Will I get a similar value for the N, right, for the slope, etc.? And how much the price is changing relatively to that trend, etc.? So, you know, you can do all kinds of different analyses. And our conclusion after we did all this analysis that, uh, yeah, they, it seems to follow this pattern, all the statistic points to being stable and consistent, et cetera. And it's not a fluke, you know. So we did all the homework, right? And so then if you go back, because, you know, I show you the, line, the graph where uh, Bitcoin looks like a straight line. But, uh, you know, once you look at it and you know once every few days you should go back and look at the graph in particular when you're worried and you know about bitcoin behavior look at the graph and remember that is following this trend right we still like this more linear graph right it's easier for us to think in you know, at least the time to be linear so you can always go back and show how that straight line looks in this graph it doesn't look like again like a uh, straight line, but curve. But now I use all that knowledge that again from that chart to make a model. So I added uh, other components, right? Because beside the general trend, we also have these bubbles, right? Very regular bubbles. And so I say, okay, can I add these components to my model? We do that all the time in physics. It's almost like modular. You start with a very simple little toy model, and then you add more complications, right? When you study, for example, a fall of an object, you first discard uh, the, um, the friction of the air, right, the resistance of the air, and then you say, okay, let's out now that we understand how a free-falling body works in vacuum, let's add, add air and see how it behaves. We do that in physics all the time. We add a little components to the model. So here what I did, I added the kind of periodic behavior around the bubbles. I also remember we observe that most of the time during the bear market, the price seems to go down to this about 60% deviation from the trend. So I also, uh, you know, I wrote this code to say, okay, 
let's force the price to go there when, you know, when we are in bear markets. Uh, and then I added, you know, like, like I say, I added uh, these uh, sign kind of waves, like to show where the bubbles are. And also because we see these, we call it, you know, diminishing returns. Basically, the deviation from the bottom to the top, if you measure the di distance from the bottom to the top for each cycle, it became smaller and smaller, right? You can kind of see it with your eyes. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, I kind of actually measure it. It turns out even that is very regular. It looks like a, 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 um, an exponential, but instead of going up, it's an exponential that is going down. So it's going down pretty fast. And so I included that in the model, you know, I included that change as measured from these three peaks. And this is why when you go in the future, you see how these bubbles are smaller and smaller because I kind of try to mimic this decrease in the size of the bubbles and projected in the future. How, we, how that, if it continues to be like that and it continues to be regular, how that will look in the future. So I put all this, and plus you see it's a little wiggly this black line because I also put some of the noise, right? It's a, it's not a, a, on a daily basis. It's a changing a little bit. I put actually the real noise that you observe on Bitcoin, right? So I, of course it's much more regular because this models the entire idea of a model is that they are always simpler than the things they want to describe, right? Because if I put so many elements to the model where uh, it's basic, it's, it's also called overfitting because you're thinking. But uh, oh, it's behaving like this. You're adding all these extra pieces, and then you are actually wrong. So it's usually a good idea to keep the model as simple as possible. And you know, here there are three simple little additions, and when you put them together, they really look like doesn't look like a very nice fit. To you tell me, you think it's a nice representation, right? Simplifications yeah. of Bitcoin behavior over time. It fits. Almost like a glove, right? There are some exceptions, like here, for example, right in uh, in uh, in the last cycle, you know, just before the last cycles. But in general, it looks very pretty fit, right? Pretty nice fit. And so then you say, okay, let's say that it continues to behave in that way. Let's project it in the future because these are all equations of time. So I can plug in future times and then see how it, it develops in the future. And so we will see. Right? Is he going to do that? <laughs> we will see. It will be really nice, right? Maybe in six months from now, one year from now, you know, we can have another talk and we can compare, right? And see how it looks like. And so it looks like, you know, this is what he's going to do. And if he's going to do that, then we can tell what the price will be um, in uh, during the peak. I already told you it's going to be around 210,000. Then you see the nice thing that is going down. And then when it's going down, is we're reaching this bottom. I think I calculated it's going to be around 60,000. So we're not going to see anything below 60,000 ever in the history of Bitcoin. And so I will continue. We'll continue until in 2033, we're going to be 1 million. And again, if Bitcoin does what it did for the last 15 years, it's basically unavoidable. It's going to happen. And we can tell even when. So, you know, this is the beauty of this model. Am I right? Am I wrong? We will see. This is how you do science. You make an hypothesis. This is nothing else than a scientific hypothesis. The data, you know, and it, the people even right, heard the other non-scientific people they want to use scientific language and don't know what they're talking about. Say, oh, the model is not falsifiable. It's very falsifiable. Right? You want a model to be falsifiable because if you make an hypothesis, and the data is not right, you know, the data doesn't show that your model, it can really predict uh, the future behavior. And by the way, again, I want to respond also to the people who say the past doesn't predict the future. What else will you use to predict the future? The past is that, you know, with asset, usually that doesn't work very well, but with very regular, almost, you know, natural law type of phenomena like Bitcoin, Yes, you know, this is exactly what you do. You take the past, you look at what happened in the past, and you project it in the future. This is how we do science. This is how we know that uh, there will be an eclipse uh, in this uh, given time, right? And so, uh, you know, if you, and so I made this joke, <laughs> 
this is a, like a you know kind of a meme because I'm trying to be also entertaining on the social media, you know. And so here I show what uh, you know the usual media uh, talks about, you know, like always this graph, this sad graph, you know, that doesn't it's so messy, it doesn't look anywhere, you know. Kramer, Kramer always you know, say all oh, bad things about Bitcoin. And this is what I usually show. You see, even here in the chart, only linear time, you know, never never the log chart. We don't even show this log linear. And here, you know, I use Sailor because uh, kind of, you know, he's like kind of an enlightened Bitcoiner. But most of us, right, most of the Bitcoiners are familiar with this, but we are not familiar with this, right? This is where I came in, crazy Italian scientist that tells you, look, you know, there is a very nice, precise pattern and this pattern is not just like a nice fitting, doesn't have anything to do with fitting. The fitting is just a tool to extract the power, you know? And that is not where the emphasis is. It's the fact that it don't look at your eyes. I don't need to make any complicated ma math. You know, tell me how do I get such nice regular pattern that it's just striking with your eye because uh, that is where your intuition comes from. It's not anymore a question of math. It's a question of looking at the graph. You know, this is why I argue many times with these pedantic math people that don't know math because they just studied in school, but they don't use it on a daily le level. They don't leave it. They don't make it, you know, their own way of thinking about the entire universe. And they tell me, oh, the math here, the math, here. the math. Look at before you do any math. Look at the graph. The graph looks like straight line. You cannot deny it. You know. So if you do something that your, your math is telling you that is not a straight line, you probably did something wrong, you know, or you don't understand what is going on. You don't understand the purpose of this. We are focusing on scale. We are focusing on big, large changes. We are not looking at the details. You know, this is what it's all about. Many times we say, yeah, you know, you're, you, of course your graph looks like in a, in a log, log knife because you are repressing the noise. That is exactly what I'm trying to do. I'm telling you, once, once you forget about the noise, uh, repress it and you make it small, then it looks like there is a pattern, you know? It's a way of looking at stuff that uh, you were going to be distracted by the noise. The, the noise in the linear chart is not a story. The signal is in the log log chart. And I'm, you know, I show you already, I'm not just me that does this kind of thing. Scientists do that all the time. So if you don't know that, go and study science, okay? And come back and then let's have a discussion. If you don't know that, Go and study science. That is my message to you. All these critics that don't know anything, you know. I'm sorry if I am angry with them, but you know, I'm kind of a little bit tired of repeating the same thing over and over again, you know. I'm, I was not born yesterday. I have a, a white beard, you know. So, and I have a PhD in physics, and there are other PhDs publishing Bitcoins and power laws, you know. I mean, this so anyway, is, uh, this is a I, I yeah, just same wondering. slide that they show you. Uh, just want to quickly jump in. I think um, I think this is all Bitcoiners are used to that, like um, because we are still so early and uh, not a lot of people actually know about Bitcoin. And I also have this feeling when I talk with people since the last four years in Bitcoin and talking about why Bitcoin makes sense. I think like I can like tell the same thing over and over again. And it's frustrating, yeah. but I think it's important if you have something that you really believe in and you think it's true, that you tell the world, uh, even if uh, people don't appreciate that. Like, and yeah. just put and it now, out. You know, it I, nice. I'm amazed about Bitcoiners because, you know, they come from all different backgrounds. Not all of them understand science, but when they look at graph like this, it's not because it's confirmation bias. Oh, look, Bitcoin is amazing, of course. No, because... I think these people have something special, in particular, this particular stage, right? And more earlier you came in and, you know, we have different experiences in life. And, you know, some of you guys are so young that 10 years ago you were a baby. So how could you get in Bitcoin? You didn't even understand it, right? So there is something special about Bitcoiners that have this intuition you know, maybe they cannot express it in all this math, etc. But they get it. They get it. They understand. And it's not just about you know making a lot of money. It's the entire philosophy behind, right? The fact that uh, it allows us to be free from government. Okay, you don't you don't care about me because you're printing money and you're making the richer richer. I'm going to invest in Bitcoin. Goodbye. You know. So these are people that are revolutionary. They are early adopters so they look forward and so even if you have different experiences we are all like a big family because 
we understand each other, right? We have we are contributing in different way. Maybe you you contribute up somewhere else, right? When you talk about Bitcoin in your own way, this other person is doing it in this other way. All of us have something to contribute and we always understand the same thing. My contribution here, being passionate about math and physics, is to give a physics look, right? But yeah, I, I, I cannot, I, I, I don't have to convince Bitcoin because we know already, maybe they are surprised. Like, see, this is the last graph I'm going to show you. Sorry if it's, I'm taking so much time, but uh, it's, there is so much interesting things, you know, like, these are one of the things that I did recently. I started to combine both this uh, growth along the power law with the regularity of a pattern. So there is such a thing, right? If you put, uh, and I didn't come up with this idea of putting Bitcoin on a circular map. Other people came up. I think one of the first people is called Rational Root. I think there was somebody else. But again, it doesn't matter if we came up. All of us contribute, right? We all work on each other. Uh, and con work and contribute, right? So my contribution, and so the idea is basically, you uh, it's something that, uh, again, like the log plot, uh, the log log plot is not my original idea. It's something that is done all the time. We always, in physics, always, when we try to understand something that is uh, cyclical, because, you know, Bitcoin has these four-year cycles, right? Because of the halving, you want to put it in a map where... Uh, Time is the, is the angle, right? Like in a clock, it's not so difficult to understand, right? It's like a clock, right? Time in a, in like maybe young people are not used to analog clocks, right? With, with the, the <laughs> and, and <laughs> right? But I, I asked, you know, older people like me with this, what we use for some time, you know, uh, and they are beautiful, right? Because it's uh, analog, it's mechanical, you know, but, uh, you know, the, the end, the time there, if you think about, is basically the angle, right? Bigger the angle, bigger the time, right? And if you do an entire cycle, it's basically 12 hours, right, for the clock, and then another cycle. Two, two cycles is an entire day, right? With Bitcoin, one cycle is four years. So you can do the same thing. You can create a clock, basically, and you say, okay, I look at the price. And in that case, you see, it's not going to be a circle because... Uh, the radius, what the radius represents is the price. So because the price goes up, instead of being a circle, it's going to be a spiral, right? Because a spiral is basically like a circle that has an increase in radius, right? But the beauty of it is when, and uh, I don't have a graph here, but you can find it in my, uh, in my YouTube or my X. It looks amazing, particularly if you, again, you're trying to average out the noise by taking averages over a long period of time, let's say one year. It looks like a beautiful, beautiful spiral. And it's a power law. It's called a power law spiral, right? Because given that the path is described by a power law, the spiral is a power law spiral. And there is such a thing in nature, again, where a, a lot of different processes are explained by power law spirals. Like, for example, the trees in a ring, you know, the tree rings. The tree rings, the way they grow, it's a power law spiral. The, how the horns are, you know, are like in a ram where the horns curl on themselves, that growth of that natural object, it's a power law spiral. You know, our planets form and they form like these beautiful spirals of the galaxy, etc. Power law spiral. Bitcoin is a power law spiral. So if you combine both the cyclical nature of uh, Bitcoin and the fact that it follows a power law and you put it all together, is a power law spiral. That is something that I realized recently. And when you put it all together, now we basically crack Bitcoin. Because look at this. Here in this graph, you know, the top part is my is a trading view script that I wrote, right? It's an indicator. So you see the general trend. It's kind of a little bit wavy because it's adaptive. This is a like a an addition that I did, like instead of being like one big straight line taking all the data. Is kind of adapting a little bit to the local data. So it kind of also works in trying to tell you a local trend instead of a general trend. It does both in a sense. So you see the general power law trend. And then, and you see how, you know, it catches the bottom. See how here the purple was perfectly telling where the bottom was, etc. But then I made another indicator where I basically took the spiral, something that looks like a clock, 
because it's thinking in very linear terms. So I came up with the best thing that could do to represent the spiral. That is basically, you know, you can take a, if you move around the circle, right, you can project uh, the dot around the cir circle. You can project it on the X of a Y axis, right? I don't mm -hmm. know if you ever, there are animations of that, like if you took a physics class or there are things like that online, right? And then basically what you get is the sign. A sine wave because a sine wave is basically is a representation of a of a of a cycle so it's a circle right so if you have a and in this case it will look like it doesn't look much here but uh, if you go back to previous cycle you see these oscillations they became bigger and bigger and bigger because the price becomes bigger and bigger right so you can see that this little first uh, sim semicircle is a little bit smaller than the other one this represents the price becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. So this is the spiral. I'll try to uh, show how the spiral looks like in a linear graph. And so the red one is basically the model, the power law model, that is this blue line. Maybe I should use the same colors, but it's basically the blue line in the linear graph. So see how it follows very, very closely the price of Bitcoin, that in this second chart is this blue line right that is kind of wiggly because uh you know the price locally of course is going to be uh you know noisy but in general look how fantastically well it follows that blue line and then you see i say oh it looks like a clock so we have zero o'clock three o'clock six o'clock and all these critical points in this clock right uh are actually significant because for example at zero o'clock you have a top look at this See, so follow a little white line here. You see how <laughs> it, it's exactly the top, right? And then three o'clock. What is three o'clock? It's the bottom. Look at this. It's exactly where the bottom is. Look at six o'clock. What is six o'clock? Well, six o'clock is basically we went through this bear market, etc. You know, the price was kind of moving along this power law, you know, with some noise, etc. And then we reach a bottom. It's basically... You are leaving a, 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 a behind the bear market. This is when you're leaving behind. So it's, I called it a transition from the bear to the start of a of a bull market. So this is when the bull market starts. Then you reach nine o'clock, and this is when the la, the price goes above a trend line. And that is usually when you have a a much crazier bull market when things are really. So it's, I call the transition to full bull market or frenzied bull market. So again, if you look at this point, it's a very significant, important point because things from that moment on are going to be like crazy. And look at this again, look how precise. And I went back, I cannot show it here because you know, it will be too cluttered. But if, I, if you go to the previous cycle, it's exactly like this. All the cycle perfectly. Look at this. I'm not making an app, right? So in, in a graph, you can even say, oh, maybe you manipulate a little bit the graph. No, you know, I actually, uh, trading view is doing it, right? You cannot manipulate trading view and look how perfect it is. Do you agree? Does it look very regular? Does it look like we are finding very important points it, on it, the chart? It, it's fascinating that uh, it actually matches with the cycle and follows that kind of a power law. And yeah. uh, I'm just now like, I'm, because I came really uh, new to this topic, I wanted to uh, don't research too much about it and come with a new mind to it, because I think most listeners are also come with that new mind to, <laughs> to that power law topic. Uh, and I think it's a lot to process. And I think, uh, and I recommend that to everyone that's kind of, and where I am right now, where I'm like, this is fascinating and I want to understand more of it. Uh, I, I actually recommend, and I never did that before, I recommend just listening to, to the whole thing twice because uh, it's, it's it's something... Yeah, uh, there is a lot of information. A lot yeah. of information, a lot of things to take in. And uh, I think it's a perfect, uh, even like a kind of a masterclass for power law, like an introduction class. 
uh, where it's like we started wise, Paolo, the major stuff then on Bitcoin, and now we're getting really in the charts. And I, honestly, I, <laughs> it's, I would I would love to give you feedback right now, but I'm kind of overwhelmed with uh, a lot of information. The only thing I can definitely say, uh, it's fascinating. And uh, you made me curious to learn uh, more about it. And you see, uh, by the way, we just, uh, so because this is where we are right now, right? So uh, the time, in fact, it will be really cool that people start to adopt this language, right? What is, a, what is the time on the, uh, you know, power law uh, spiral clock, right? The PLS clock. Uh, and you can say, right, right now it's like what? I, and I can even calculate. In fact, I want to make a, a clock and put it online live, you know, so people can see what time it is on the clock. So right now it's basically make, maybe like what? Six, five, six, ten. And that means we are over this bump that represents a transition from there to start of the bull market, right? So really cool that this kind of feels like that, right? That we left behind the bull market, the bear market, and we are entering the bull market. We are not yet in the frenzy period, right? When uh, it's nine o'clock, but it's really cool. It's a way of thinking about these cycles and using this terminology. It's a really another interesting way of talking about Bitcoin, right? Maybe it's a, it will, people will stick with that terminology, right? What time it is? Oh, 6.15, 9.30, you know? And it's very useful because it tells you what to do, you know, if you want to do investing, because it depends on your style, like we discussed in the beginning, maybe you want to hold, you know, like you probably don't want to buy Bitcoin when it's uh, zero o'clock because, you know, just wait until it's three o'clock and then buy, you know, save your money. So if this continues to do the same thing, it gives you an idea of when is, you know, when you should do this year. And if you want to continue, maybe do a little bit less this year, right? When you are a, close to zero o'clock and then go really AV when it is three o'clock and so on and so on. Right? I think and, you I think this would be an I, really... I, actually these are we, we can end here if you if you want because I made this joke and you know, I say I'm going to the, I'm going to tell everybody about power loss. I'm going to the physics conference, you know, to the Bitcoin conference actually. I didn't invent this uh, this actually power laws are so used in physics that uh, we kind of almost like make fun of ourselves. So somebody else made this shirt because it's an internal joke that it's they are so common and so many papers are published about finding power laws everywhere that you know we want to you know be a little bit self-deprecating so we made a joke oh you know i went to a physics conference and all i i got was a lousy power law and they say okay i'm going to scratch physics and i'm going to say bitcoin i'm going to sell a bunch of shirt to the next uh, bitcoin conference you know and this is my like one of the representations, kind of color coded, you know, relatively <laughs> where we are, and so you know, it's it's yeah, you know, we should always make fun of ourselves, you know, we should we should not take ourselves too seriously, but you know, still, uh, even if it is a meme, there is some truth there, you know, and and it's really really fascinating, and you know, I would like to explore this with other Bitcoin Bitcoiners, so. Come to my ex account, come to the YouTube, uh, you know, and let's talk about these things, you know, and trying to understand Bitcoin better. Yeah, I think a uh, website where you show like a clock and which time it is and stuff like that, uh, this would be really good in in marketing this this whole idea that where you can put uh, put people also where like this is the weight weighted DCA you should have and with a normal DCA you would have so much Bitcoin with a weighted DSA you would have so much Bitcoin right. and like I, I think you can do a lot of uh, marketing uh, stuff on top of this model because they're yes, like data yes. there's the models but then you also have to put it in nice charts in nice marketing things uh, to people that uh, people grasp uh, things and this is basically what I want to do with, with Bitcoin itself, like make it uh, simple. By the way, I really cool. love your accent. You know, I think uh, this will be really a cool interview where uh, there are two people with some crazy accents. Right? <laughs> Yours is more like Schwarzenegger accent. You know? yeah, yeah. But it's I, really I, I, nice. I, get that I love it. <laughs> I, I get it a lot that I speak like Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, right. <laughs> there, there are some people that uh, want me to say, uh, get back to the chopper. For a 
right, <laughs> well, right. I'll, I'll be back. Uh, they they, yeah. they wanted me to say that for a long time in the podcast now. And I think my this is my 55th podcast. So I finally did it. I finally said it. <laughs> yes, yes. Because, you know, you find somebody else with an even stronger accent than yours, you know, and uh, hopefully people understand what we are talking about. But I think actually it would be really cute, you know, that both of us have a, a strong accents, you know, so it's so, so cool. Uh, yeah, it's, it's... <laughs> it tells also about you know how universal Bitcoin is, right? Because people from different countries, different experiences, you know, we all come together. It's a world thing, right? So different accent, different cultures, you know, it's really amazing, you know. It's a, that is one of the cool things about being in this space that you meet so many different people from different countries, different backgrounds, you know, and we have all these common things, you know, that we love freedom, we want to do amazing things in the world that you know so yeah it's exciting yeah, it's 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 like an uh, uh it, it's like a base layer to our whole financial system and fa finances is so fundamental to our life that it's like unites whole uh the whole globe with like one uh base layer of asset like it's an it's interesting thought model like where can this go when we're like l looking 50 100 years in the future and how will society change when we have one fundamental layer that's all across the, the globe and there's a lot of freedom involved in there like but yeah uh, this is this is one thing uh, because i wanted to start the, the podcast because i think we are in a really early stage of an extreme uh, revolution and the goal that i have to interview as many bitcoiners as possible i'm now doing uh, seven seven to nine podcasts a week i'm publishing five of them per week i want to publish like six and go to a daily upload schedule at some point but i need more time for that and in march i make the step to do it full-time like now i'm working till part-time but in march i'm going full-time on that so uh and i just want to document uh the thoughts uh, because yeah we don't have the documentation of the internet that well uh, imagine a podcast that uh, interviews all the people involved in building up the internet in 1995. Right. That would be sure. sick to watch. And uh, this is basically what I want to do with with, with, with my podcast, documenting the whole yeah, journey. It's, it's a very good idea. And... and I really enjoy your um, podcast. I watch it all the time, every time you have an interview, because it's also a way of dif knowing different Bitcoiners, what they are doing, you know, what is... Uh, their way because everybody's contributing their own ways you know like uh, different projects different ideas different approaches it's so fantastic you know? yeah perfect um we are uh, the first time ever i'm approaching the two hour mark <laughs> oh sorry for that <laughs> it's, no no it's uh, i think it's something good because if you have a lot to talk it means there's a lot of value and content in there uh and i think uh the, the the longer i do the podcast the longer the podcasts will go <laughs> but yeah let's see um and we're having uh, if you watch the podcast we're having an end routine uh where the previous guest asked a question for the next guest uh the your previous guest was uh, knut swanholm uh you probably know him the the, mm -hmm. the author of like uh, really cool uh, books and i think he invented the meme of uh, everything divided by 21 million uh, Very and, nice. uh yeah. a lot of cool stuff and he asked you the question uh it's like you have to know a film for that question <laughs> but uh, i didn't know about that question what is the airspeed velocity of an unleaden swallow oh <laughs> this is a monty python yeah right? it's a monty python yeah 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 it's <laughs> so cool I, I don't remember what was the answer uh i am a nerd and i love monty python but uh I, I remember the context, right? That it was basically, uh, uh, you know, they say, where do you get these coconuts? Because we were uh, playing, you know, I actually remember that movie so funny because I, I was like a kid and I was uh, very much in middle age things. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, they say, oh, and now we have a Monty Python and the search of Holy Grail. I say, oh, cool, you know, because I knew what the Holy Grail was. It's, it's a middle age movie. It's a night movie, you know? Then I, I look at this thing, I say, what the heck is going on? <laughs> you know, these guys have coconuts, you know, they have coconuts for, to play their horse hooves, you know. And, it, and the Italian version is all in dialects. Every 
you know, the French are Sicilian, talking in Sicilians, and, you know, because in Italy we have all these different dialects, you know, and it was so funny. I was like, I was disappointed because, you know, I wanted a serious night movies. At mm -hmm. the same time, it was so funny that uh, I was like rolling on the ground. I still remember the first experience, and I do remember that passage because, you know, they said, where did you, you know, this is England, where did you get the coconuts? And, say, and they started to say, well, it came from a sparrow. But, uh, you know, the sparrow cannot really live to it. And we have all this very in-depth discussion about the physics of the flight of a, of a sparrow. <laughs> and I don't remember, you know, what uh, the exact thing was, but uh, it was these crazy calculations we were doing about, uh, you know, how far a, a sparrow could go with a coconut, etc. It's so hilarious. And I think actually it's relevant because, you know, it's like a kind of a self-deprecating thing, right? You know, in one end, yeah, very solid is math, etc. But you know, like a little bit like this meme, right? You know, like you, you, you know, it's not that you are going to try to push it forever. Where okay, you know, yeah, it's everything a power law, etc. But you know, at the same time, even that meme was funny because, in a certain sense, it's true, right? How the heck a sparrow can bring? Uh, you know, if you use physics, you realize it's impossible, right? So it was a joke, but it was not a joke at the same time, right? So it's relevant. So even if I didn't answer straight, I think I kind of answer, right? Do you agree? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I actually, <laughs> when he asked the question, I was like, what is that? And oh, it's a Monty Python uh, thing. Uh, I think yeah. it's from uh, the Monty Python and the search of the Holy Grail. Yeah. Yeah, the Holy, Holy Grail. Grail. Yeah, it's like 1970, 1980 or something like that. It's like an old movie. Right, right. Uh, I think it it's was a classic, it, right? It, it was around that time when my father was born. So it's like, <laughs> it's long before my right, time. Right, right. Yeah. But you can find it on the internet. And, uh, you know, yeah. usually like very nerdy people, they memorize it, you know, like all the lines, etc. So for sure, uh, he's a nerd like me. And I knew the context. Like I say, I don't remember by heart, but the, the discussion, but it was all about, you know, using physics to understand how come these guys have the coconuts, right? Because they're using co It's very ab absurd, right? It's like a, this uh, English humor that is like absurd, right? Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not and realistic, I, but yeah. And I love that right. he uh, put the question and you got the question because it is, it is not planned something. Like I, I don't plan when who is on, like, uh, as I, I do it with you, like, I just send the link out and you pick your date and time when you have time. Uh, and he also, and uh, it's it's fascinating. And he uh, gives the question to you because I think uh, it's it's it, it fits you perfectly. And I think the, the 90% of all the other guests, uh, it would have not been as suitable for that question. <laughs> Yeah, he, he asked the right question. Yes, yeah. it's per pertinent. Yeah, it's yeah, meaningful. Perfect. Then, uh, um, before we end, is there anything you want to to add to today? Uh, and uh, where can people find you? The best way, like where can and people you were saying, I need to make up a question so that I can do that on, offline for the next. Yeah, I guess. usually I do it. I usually do it offline. Uh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, so really, I can think about, and yeah. also you can tell me who is the next guest. Yeah. So okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I, right now I have uh, uh, three uh, different channels. So one is my X account, right? It was in the beginning of the slides. Maybe uh, if you have a link, etc., cetera, and your uh, video, that will be great. Mm -hmm. So people can come to my X account. I also have a YouTube account. So please, if you want to support me, because I'm trying to make this kind of a full-time job to be a uh, Bitcoin researcher and educator. So um, if you can... I'm, you know, I'm doing a very Spartan life because I'm, you know, like sleeping on the floor so I can stack more Bitcoins. But, uh, you know, I need to still pay bills. So if you like my work and you want to support me, please come to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe and all the other things. If you really like my job, my work uh, even more, you can also support me with Patreon. And by the way, um, the Patreon as uh, uh, you can get the indicators, you know, that they show as part of being, uh, you know, I'm a community member because I have like a Discord channel. And so we are creating a little community there where we discuss all these things uh, and we help each other, you know, through trying to understand this knowledge behind the power law. So if you want to join our community there, you can do it through Patreon. It's very 
uh, inexpensive, you know, to the basic support, like $5, you know, just symbolic. So, yeah, these are the different channels. And that will give you the link. So if you don't mind to uh, link all these things on, uh, on your uh, video so people can find me and interact with me and you know, we can learn these things together. Yeah, the, the video will also be posted, the full video on X, on YouTube and all the podcast platforms. So uh, actually most of the listeners are actually on X, so they can just click on, uh, because I tag usually they, think, sure. they, they can just click on your uh, profile and then they see everything from you. And Great. on YouTube and all the other platform, I will just put like the link and then they can go to your profile and see all the perfect. following links. I think this would be perfect. Then, uh, yeah, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for being on. And, my pleasure, uh, my pleasure. I, maybe we can re-reset the, the whole thing in one year and see how it, how it went. Yeah, it would be interesting would be, would compare be fun a prediction and what really Bitcoin did. Uh, perfect. And thank you for being on. My pleasure. Thank you so much.